thanks for coming out on the snowy evening. I think those of us who did were well rewarded by what we just saw. Uh, if you live through those times, uh, and I was in Washington during that whole period, uh, involved in a presidential campaign that was not Richard Nixon's, uh, uh, you had a sense of the drama, but I never had the human texture of it, even though a fair number of the people who were portrayed on the stage tonight. Uh, so I loved it, and I felt like standing and sharing it and catching it and said, publish it. Uh, now, this was really, and, and, and I, you, you have program notes on guests and, and, and this, so I'm not going to spend a bunch of time on these two. Uh, they're both extraordinary people. Uh, and this was the beginning of culture and politics that repelled truths. There's a play suggests at the end, this is just before Watergate, uh, this is just before the church investigation, which comes later, uh, just before the investigation and the assassination of President Kennedy, uh, and the whole notion grew up, I think, that somehow or other secrecy was if not fundamentally wrong, because sometimes it's necessary, but that the presumption should be against it in a democratic society. Uh, and I guess I'll start by asking Jeff, do you think 9-11 has changed that whole culture, and that even under this administration, we have created a new regime of secrecy? I do think we do have a regime of secrecy, and I think that helps It's also true that the Times knew in 2004 about the invasion of people's private phone records. Uh, we were in the midst of a presidential campaign. The administration said, oh, no, this would really damage national security. You can't do this. And basically, the Times held off for a year. Yeah, I, you know, in watching this wonderful play, And it 
Sometimes the recipients of those documents or that information seem to tell us that they're aluminum tubes designed to create atomic bombs. Yellow tape is being bought in Niger. And so the New York Times, which was published in the Pentagon Papers 40 years ago, 30 some years later, is basically publishing a whole set of information based on leaked documents. And I'm going to ask the question at the end of this based on leaked documents that made a false argument about weapons of mass destruction and gave credibility to a rationale for going to war. How, 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 do, how does the press, how is the press, or how is the recipient, how is the young village voice reporter who gets this, supposed to judge the validity of those documents? Or, I mean, the, in the way the Pentagon Papers case is easy, there's a whole bunch of documents, they were all there. The ones that were being handed out, say from Henry Kissinger, to advance a specific uh, policy,
I think that's absolutely true of the information and the stuff that is in there about what happens in mass destruction. Uh, that, and, and, and some of them, I believe, would happen in that case was that reporters would use the name, would identify people in a way that would attract misleading. My village voice experience, though, which I want to mention, is this. Uh, because it speaks to Mrs. Point that this may have been just a moment in history. A year before this uh, happened, um, I was writing a column for the village voice for the folk uh, songs and music program in the United States. And somebody who we to this day have protected uh, uh, as our source brought us the information about something that many of you probably heard of called Operation Phoenix. We built in the village voice the first story of Operation Phoenix. The next week, we wrote a story about how we happened to have that story without revealing our source. Because the story had actually originally been reported by George Orson. And as editors at the Post had called the CIA and called the, this was a target assassination operation run by the CIA, called the Defense Department, they had that it existed. And at that point, the Post was convinced that the government wouldn't have it yet. And they didn't want any story. And so it was left to the village voice to run the story. So what, what, we're, what we're really talking about is how it was a moment of cynicism about government, which has, you know, which has proven not to stay a number of times in American history, this time certainly among them, and, and over the last 10 years also among them. Uh, and also has led to these sort of poll numbers that all the that so many of the government institutions are now getting. I mean, there's a, there's a negative side to not trusting the government and holding these folks that we need uh, from the tape. This is really interesting. I mean, and, uh, and, and, you know, and we've seen that. We've seen presidents who are no longer trusted. In most ways, that's a good thing. But that's a really positive thing. Let me ask you, um, you've been in so many important positions as a Says I've never had a security clearance, and I doubt that I could get one uh, because I mostly spent my time in politics. But sure, uh, you get calls that are sometimes completely preposterous and with allegations that are completely crazy, and you work very hard to see that that doesn't get in print. So you don't use the court. Uh, you don't. You have to persuade either reporters or editors. On occasion, one occasion I actually persuaded Ben Bradley not to print something. Uh, but it was something that was not true, and he got quite satisfied that it wasn't true. But I think that the, the deeper problem here is the one Mitch just alluded to. Well, I'm a lawyer, a failed lawyer. I never practiced law at the law school, but we had a lot of hard cases make bad law. I think the Nixon years really did incredible damage along with Vietnam itself and all that led up to it, to this level of trust that you were talking about. Uh, every president had clearly, at one time or another, tried to manipulate the press, tried to use a secret document. But the Nixon experience culminating in Watergate was so wholesale that I think that at some level we've never recovered from it. Now, it is healthy in the sense that it makes us doubt and disrespect the occurrences we're given. It's unhealthy in the sense that if you want to look at what some of the stuff that's said about President Obama and the public out there willing to believe some of the most absurd things because in their lives, in their experiences, or in what they've heard, it turned out that something that seemed completely far-fetched and wholly implausible was true. Uh, I'm going to ask one other question, and then I want to throw this open to, the, to all of you. Uh, the, you refer to the speech that, that JFK gave to the newspaper publishers uh, in, I think it was early on in 1961, yes, which he did regret and uh, was actually quite angry at himself for giving afterwards. But it came just after the Bay of Pigs. And the thing that's most interesting about the Bay of Pigs was the New York Times had a story 
that would have blown the Bay of Pigs up And the president called the publisher and owner of the New York Times and persuaded him not to publish the story. And afterwards, called him and said, how much I wish you had published that story. Now, there's no doubt that if the Times had said, we're going to go ahead and publish it, and they'd gone into court by the rubrics that we saw in this trial, uh, even this judge would have said, wait a minute, this is about troop movements in which the United States is at least assisting, if not, if it's not American soldiers. It's about an ongoing operation. You may not publish it. So how does the press make the decision? I mean, J.K. may have wished he published it, but how could it, somebody at the Times ever make the decision to do that under those circumstances? Could they? What if we knew today that there was a secret raid, military raid being planned uh, on Iran for a week from now? I, I think that the, the press that we know wouldn't print that story, but your question is could they if they wanted to? This, this particular case legally, which you know, is about the fact that the legal charges of prior restraint, that is, when can the courts actually start taking some of the in advance? If the government didn't know that the newspaper had the story, which could print the story, then they could possibly charge. What if the government did know? Well, I think the government probably could, under certain narrow circumstances, stop the, the printing of, uh, of, of, of certain stories. That's right. And, and that's part of the point of this, too, is it's not as broad a victory as people assume it is. And, you know, there's so many ways in which things have changed. Nick referred to, I think, as largely technology, but technological changes that have changed. But today, Oprah is a pretty simple bottom line. Um, but there's so many other changes that have also been, uh, been made. One of them you talked about is the financial stability of things, but another is the competition of the Supreme Court. But, you know, that's another, there's no new growth on it. Uh, another, I don't want to let you put a quick chance face up, but another way that this is a moment is a new kind of press is developing in the United States in the 20th century, an objective press, supposedly nonpartisan press. So there was a long tradition of, uh, of newspapers attacking presidents in the United States. Uh, one president of the United States, when he, uh, when he left office, uh, a prominent publisher or printer wrote, if ever a nation was debauched by a man, the American nation was debauched by Washington. Uh, and uh, so, so there was, so this happened a lot, but it always happened from the opposition party. You knew where it was coming from. What developed in the United States is this, you know, this objective press, this nonpartisan press, and it was very strange that they would be attacking. And this, of course, said that our enemies, that everybody was in the enemies for a while. But, uh, but this was kind of a new thing. And, and, you know, when we talk about changes now, aside from technological changes, that's starting to change a little bit. Well, if you look at cable news, for example, maybe that's a little bit like the old press. So, you know, you know the clock is going to change certain perspectives. You know that uh, it's going to be true. It's going to change certain perspectives. And nobody's laughing to what they're seeing. So, so uh, you know, so it's, it was one thing to get attacked by the... Uh, the predecessors of Fox or MSNBC, but it's another thing to get attacked from, from this, this odd little position. These people who are so much part of the establishment were attacking the establishment. They're attacking the president. And I think one of the spooky of the story is kind of one of those amazing bits of history that uh, I was talking to any press my friend, Bob Mackinac, a very close friend, but uh, I just never really mentioned him uh, on the thing. But Henry Kissinger gave one of his eulogies at the funeral. But afterwards, I, I think he's probably one of the second wife or second wife after the Nixon administration. Uh, as a former pupil of his, by the way, a, a, a long time ago, he, he was a much more moderate person in the mid '60s. I think he had this brief period with Nixon when he was not brief; it wasn't brief, and he was, in his view, the man that could just sign the invasion to war. And in some ways, he did. Well, I think part of what we try to show in the play is that there are small groups that are not friendly. I mean, the, the Overton of China was a big deal, and we've all benefited from that. We felt that the China uh, negotiation plan actually ended if the Chinese didn't believe that we could keep secret. He was also keeping Nixon happy by coming up with reasons for 
satisfy, I think, that's his paranoia. He, Nixon didn't like him very much, actually, and this was sort of in many ways like Nelson. Uh, I think it's just for the open to. Are there, are there, do you have minds that might work or might, or maybe bring it over? Because this is being, uh, this is being reported, so if anybody has a fear of being, of being on the hold, say it's in there. I've just been seeing the inquiring also from the state just now in America. It just seems surprising in a way that both of these uh, documents come to light at the same time. Were you in any way influenced by the timing of this play by that coincidence? Was it really just coincidence? Uh, it's coincidence because if this play was originally performed at the end of the first act, it was Susan Lomberg was in the audience for a run for Los Angeles stage, actually. And if, you, if you listen to radio drama, you listen to Susan this was originally performed at the end of the, of the first Gulf War in the National Broadcast National Library. So the conversation afterward was the real Ben Bradley and the real George Wilson Temple. So we had no idea that they would be there. We had nothing about this. But in fact, we had tried to put together a, 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 a day in New York, we still had no idea where, where there'd be a screening of most dangerous men. And it was such a mystery that was really going on. Uh, I thought one of the highlights of the play was Catherine's words, let's public. Uh, I think a lot of us believe in curated journalism, that there is a role for responsible journalism. Uh, 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 and obviously, the play reveals also the decision making process of the government to classify things because they want to. I'm interested how you feel about this in today's era with the Huffington Post and bloggers in terms of, quote, the curated aspect of how you control that kind of leakage, if you will. I think it's actually interesting. I was shooting on Mitch Powers' sketch of five days. I don't think, although I believe that the era is different, I don't think many important stories have so far been broken that way. It's, it's interesting. I mean, the, the Talking Points memo did an amazing job of revealing what's happening to the other side. On the other side of the equation, the um, CBS story that you and I we did about, uh, uh, about President Bush's uh, National Guard Service was at a certain level debunked by people uh, who were using uh, it, who were using it. And I can't think of any major stories that involve any national secrets that are involved with that. And you have things like TMZ, which is sort of a scandal celebrity site, which reveals that. I may be missing it. Uh, but I, I, I don't think how about Drudge and Monica Lewinsky. Uh, I can well, say, but it proved to be a so Drudge, but, but Newsweek had the story. He, he pushed it earlier in the very similar to the. But he, he, he actually in, in 2004, during the Wisconsin primary, did one of his red lights, uh, alleging that John Kerry had an affair with an intern, which led me to have a private conversation with John Kerry in an airplane hangar. It was entirely untrue, and you asked about the bunker or something. Right. It took us two or three days, and even though at the end people decided it, it was flatly untrue, that it was flatly untrue, uh, Kerry, who won the Wisconsin primary, he had been leading by 20 points, he won by six over John Edwards. Now, you, you want to take, you want to take, I'll tell you, that is a story that was broken in the National Enquirer, and then was promoted by Mickey Callis on Callis Files and Slate. And he, I kept saying, Mickey, you're crazy. This this isn't true. I'm not particularly a fan of John Edwards at this point. I said, this isn't true. And he kept insisting that it was true, and it turned out to be true. And it's interesting to me that the Lewinsky example, the, the Edwards example, uh, and probably some others that we can think of, all the I know Mark Sanford broke the story himself because he said he was on the Appalachian Trail. Uh, but but all relate to sort of the personal lives of politicians, and I don't think it has a lot to do with this play. I actually worry about that. And the rules are different. They have to recognize the rules are different, and they have to live by the new rules. But as I look back in history, I certainly wouldn't trade Jefferson, Roosevelt, and Kennedy for Nixon, Hoover, and you know somebody else. So I, it's a 
it's, it's, that's where I think they're breaking things. Now, I bet we will get to the point where a blogger will break a big national coverage story. And will we get to the point where, where a blogger will cause trouble by breaking it? But this, this, this national security is not doing that. And I think it's, I think it's, it's likely to happen. It's pretty interesting that it hasn't happened yet. There's a story, that, there's so many stories in the press these days that are national. This is simply a wonderful play, and there's something I'd like to ask about it. In the last section, the play, the victory of the Pope is based upon three examples which the government claims is top secret, and which is proved to be not secret at all. But now, the Pope is able to put my play what is presumably thousands of documents that have been so far unexamined. Where does the, what is left then? Where is the control, or is there any, as far as the play is concerned, as far as the further printing of the paper? I mean, what you're saying is that the post now has the free and clear judgment to think for itself as to what will threaten or not threaten national security. We try to have the play lead you thinking that we think that they have the freedom to include the responsibility. That's what the lawyer is arguing and what the speaker is arguing. But in fact, as, as Bob was suggesting before, the freedom may be a lot less broad than people have assumed in this case. Because if the post had really had this, if they had really been secret, First of all, we're going to be genuine and critical of the fact that we're not And secondly, if they were committed, there still would be other kinds of criminal prosecution against them. So, although it seems like the press kind of keeps it to the more narrow than people may assume, I'm arguing on top of that that the mainstream press, at least for all the verification of it, is pretty careful about what it prints and what it's going to make it more secret. And it is remarkable looking back to the history of American history. Examples where the press printed something that caused trouble. You can find examples where, you know, if the Japanese had read a newspaper in Chicago, they might have known about something. But these examples are extremely rare. I mean, people look for them. People look for them. So it hasn't been a problem in American history. It has not. Yeah, I think when they, what, what happened here is a matter of law. If I can say this is a matter of practice of law, is the government sought prior restraint. The burden of proof was extremely, was on the government, number one. And number two, it was very direct. They had to prove that there were documents. And if they had access to the entire 7,000 pages, they had to prove that there were documents in there that would endanger the national security. And I take it what the judge was saying is, look, you had your best shot. You know, if that's what you found and you pointed to as a danger, and you saw all 7,000 pages, then I'm not worried about the rest of the pages. And, you know, the, the instinct of the government is to think there is a dangerous information here, or to block it because it's embarrassing, political damage, and a lot of other reasons. It makes the press reaction of the 
there's not more work to do with the hands. But they just usually they don't to just be totally embarrassed by something, but they try to remove the allegation. And once the allegation is examined, you can actually be able to show to demonstrate whether it's true or not. So the courts originally used to think that these were in real time space, they didn't go through the chance of that chance. And they removed the burden of that chance. Well, in most cases, a few days later, they forced the government to particularize those things that they said were secret, rather than just asserting them. And it wasn't until you could tell the person with a particular claim that it could know the exact secrets. And as Nick said, amazingly, in American history, there are very few, if any, examples of intelligence that the government has functioned with the press has actually turned information that would meet the standard that we're talking about. Give me the little white straight 24. 24 is a question that a lot of people see as a question. And, and the reason why it's a question is because it's like people hang on. It's, 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 it's such an important There's only 20 minutes in which to find out if somebody's going to get a nuclear weapon to the left. So you think, well, you know, maybe torture is okay in those circumstances. But that isn't a real case. That isn't the way the circumstances under which torture is taking place are not. And it's not clear that torture under those circumstances would work at all. It might, in fact, have the opposite effect. But you get the, the, the distortion you see there. In this case, as far as we know, national security, in a, in a real sense, we're talking about here, that is jeopardizing a particular branch of military command, has very rarely has ever been jeopardized by the government. Could it happen? That's been very rare. Interested in a, a quick sense of a global context to this. Um, the U.S. actually has much less restrictive laws on what the press can do than, well, as a result of this case, than, say, the U.K., in which we get otherwise lots of, our, of an impact of these announcements. And um, is it just a cultural difference? Do they have something right we don't? Is it a mere coincidence that, for example, most of the governing institutions and the press itself have much higher approval ratings in the U.K. than the U.S.? Curious about putting the U.S. situation that you all talked about so eloquently and that we saw so eloquently presented in that kind of context. I'll just say one, one thing about this and one thing I want to mention to the officers here. That you probably know that it's much easier to get a libel taken here than in the U.K. And so uh, a lot of cases now where people want to be able to sue the American press for libel, they'll sue even when the twenty copies of the publication have been distributed there. The biggest difference in that country and in the, in the rest of the world is that the First Amendment and the courts have the ability to enforce what is unusual to them in terms of the act of court enforcement of the First Amendment. I think the difference has kind of diminished very substantially. And the reason for that is that uh, unless we have very, very deep pockets, do not dare sue for libel in Britain because the loser pays the cost. And the costs are enormous. So if you're a very wealthy arms dealer and you think you've been libeled, you can go ahead and sue. That's number one. Number two, and that's what happens, by the way, if somebody does a piece of investigative journalism and you have a case that, that goes after somebody who's very rich and they get sued in the UK because the assumption is that they have less money to defend themselves. The second thing is, in terms of the political life of the country, and I've done some work there, uh, I used to do some work there, in terms of the political life of the country, I don't think any politician at this point in Britain would dare to sue. Uh, it's just the reaction would to keep the story, whatever the story was, going and going and going, give the press more and more permission to write about it. And in truth, the standards of accuracy and Mitch may disagree with me on this. The standards of accuracy and the standards of responsibility and self-discipline, in my view, are much, much higher in the United States than they are in the British press. Uh, finally, I should thank Rogan for that question. He, he 
associate dean of the Wagner School, and I want to thank all the people from Wagner who sort of helped us with this tonight. And I'm here because of the Wagner School and because of Jeff. Uh, and Mitch is here because of NYU. And I want to thank all of you. And to the NYU Wagner School, we really appreciate it. This is the first of 12 post-performance discussions um, around these top secrets about all the Pentagon Papers. You can find a complete schedule on the York Theater Workshop's uh, website or at topsecrettalks.org. Thanks so much for coming tonight. <laughs>